Aside from Der Bauer, there's one major problem with extreme overclocking and liquid nitrogen benchmarking, and that is it's all done with synthetic benchmarks like TimeSpy, which are great for competitive scoring and seeing how the cards plays. But what we're doing today is gaming benchmarks. So we're running the Kingpin 2080 Ti through our actual benchmark suite for GPUs, including real games like Sniper Elite 4, F1 2018, Far Cry 5, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and we're doing it while it's under liquid nitrogen. So we're going to be mounting an LN2 pot to the card, going through the benchmarks, trying to maintain the pot temperature, and see how much does it scale in reality when you're at 2565 megahertz. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermal Grizzly and their high-end thermal compounds. Thermal Grizzly makes cryonaut paste for high thermal performance and conductivity without being electrically conductive, so you don't have to worry about shorting components. Cryonaut is particularly good for replacing stock GPU pastes, as Cryonaut is a non-curing compound. Learn more at the link in the description below. The most common complaint we've gotten in the liquid nitrogen overclocking streams is that apparently people think it's not practical or something. So we're going to show you how easy it really is. All you need is a three to four hundred dollar liquid nitrogen pot. Uh, ideally, you also get a nineteen hundred dollar video card that is pre-prepared for liquid nitrogen, although you could do some hard mods yourself. You'll need a giant tub of Vaseline, a brush, some good paste for minus 130 or below degrees Celsius temperature, so we're using KPX for that. You'll need a heat gun and uh, that, some liquid nitrogen. So this is actually something everyone can do at home. Please actually look into what you're doing if you if you try to follow that advice. Uh, so yeah, it's it's obviously impractical. But what we're gonna do is set it up and do some gaming with LN2 anyway. And all we need to do for this is clean off the card, get Vaseline all over the memory on the VRM. There's already some applied. We'll heat it up, and doing all of this will prep us for running the card at around minus 130 degrees Celsius. Seems where this one likes to run. We're going to be using uh, settings of about 2565 megahertz or thereabouts for the core, and we'll have a setting of uh, about 1500 megahertz offset for the memory. Then voltage will be in the range of about 1.325 to 1.4 for vCore, and we'll be running about 1.5 for the memory voltage, and uh, NVVDD OCP will be turned off, and that should be about all we need. So then finally, to answer the comment of liquid nitrogen overclocking is, is pointless because you can't play games, we will now raise you with, uh, actually, yes, you can. And all we have to do is have two people, one to manage the pot temperature and one to play the game, and that will be everything required for the LN2 gaming benchmarks, and then we'll get into the numbers. So what we'll be doing is we're gonna set Patrick up to play a game. I will be managing the liquid nitrogen pot temperature and pouring more LN2. Between the two of us, we should be able to actually game while on LN2. So we'll have some numbers and actual charts and benchmarks the exact same way as every other GPU that we have on the charts. And uh, it'll get you get you all the information so we can see the actual scaling while we're doing gaming benchmarks on something that's at, say, 500 megahertz higher than the actual uh, stock cards are really meant to run. That'll show us once and for all what kind of scaling there is, if any, in real gaming workloads and not just in synthetic workloads. Sniper Elite 4 starts us out. This game uses DirectX 12 in the best implementation we've seen to date for a game and has known scaling to avoid CPU bottlenecks on our platform. We also use asynchronous compute, which is well leveraged on modern architectures. The Kingpin 2080 Ti at 2565 MHz core and plus 1500 memory, putting it about 500 MHz more than most overclocked 2080 Ti's, ends up at 148 FPS average with extremely well-timed low performance. In fact, the LN2 KP card outperforms the water-cooled KP overclocks 131 FPS average by an impressive 13.5%. Moreover, it significantly outperforms the borderline instability experienced in our water-cooled overclock. Compared to the stock Kingpin card at 120 FPS average, the improvement with LN2 is 24%, with the frequency increase about 26% over the 2040 MHz baseline. This is fairly linear scaling and shows impressive gains, although a large part of that is attributable to the well-built nature of Sniper Elite 4. 
Interestingly, the NVLink 2080 Ti cards end up at about 210 FPS average, posting nearly perfect scaling, but the KP2080 Ti splits the difference when under LN2 between the NVLink and the stock single card results. Not bad. Here's where it gets interesting. This frame time plot shows the Kingpin 2080 Ti stock card performance plotted in blue, with the LN2 2080 Ti KP card reaching frame times closer to 6 milliseconds. That's impressive. Remember, lower is better here, and the consistency is even more impressive. We don't encounter any excursions from the mean equal to or greater than 8 milliseconds, so the user gets functionally a perfect fluid experience at around 150 FPS average with good frame times. For reference, 16.667 milliseconds would be 60 FPS average, which we are well below, but the KP2080 Ti with water cooling and a borderline unstable overclock encountered more excursions that manifest as small stutters in gameplay. Clearly, gaming on LN2 is both very practical and objectively superior, and everyone should immediately buy LN2 pods, doers, and switch to LN2 gaming rigs with co-drivers for pouring. F1 2018 is next, giving us a DirectX 11 title to look at. For this one, the only setup that beats our LN2 KP card is the dual card Titan RTX configuration with NVLink, running a 175 FPS average with frankly abysmal frame time consistency. The KP2080 Ti at 2565 MHz and plus 1500 MHz memory runs at 138 FPS average, meaning the dual Titan RTXs lead only by 26%, despite having a financial requirement nearing three times higher. Versus the water-cooled KP overclock at 122 FPS average, our increase is an impressive 14%, with 0.1% low frame time performance doubled. Compared to the stock 2080 Ti cane bin at 113 FPS average, the increase is 23%, and it's about 31% faster than the 2080 Ti XE Ultra's 106 FPS average. Shadow of the Tomb Raider is next, swinging us back to DirectX 12. For this one, the LN2 cooled cane pin 2080 Ti at 2565 MHz core, and again, a boosted memory, gets us to 92 FPS average for an improvement over the previous overclock's 82 FPS average by 13%. This is a consistent uplift, it seems, although the lows are much improved over the previous overclock. Clearly, we have once again proven that liquid nitrogen gaming is, in fact, the only way to achieve high refresh gaming, and we hope that all esports arenas immediately change their cooling systems to ensure no dropped frames. To the credit of the NV Link cards here, the scaling is sort of insane, with the Titan RTX at 138 FPS average and the 2080 Ti at about 147 FPS average when running on its higher clocks and better coolers than we had the Titan RTX running. Even with LN2, the KP2080 Ti has a long distance to go to be a chart topper, but it certainly chart tops for single card configurations. GTA 5 is still one of the most popular games on Steam, and so we thought the GTA 5 community would be happy to know the completely realistic and attainable frame rates with Liquid Nitrogen Gaming. For this game, tested at 4K with two-tap MSAA and very high to ultra settings, we measured the LN2 Kanebin 2080 Ti at 97 FPS average with well-timed low frame time performance. The uplift over the water-cooled 2080 Ti Kanebin overclock is about 11.5%, moving from 87 to 97 FPS average. Compared to the stock 2080 Ti Kingpin card and its 2040 MHz average clock, which is already on the level of an average overclocks 2080 Ti, we end up improved by about 21% versus the 80 FPS average baseline. Far Cry 5 is last. For this one, tested again at 4K, the 2080 Ti Kingpin under liquid nitrogen ends up at 103 FPS average, approaching the NVLink 2080 Ti's. Although NVLink doesn't scale as cleanly here as in a title like Sniper Elite 4. The 103 FPS average puts us improved over the H2O overclocks 92 FPS average by 12%, sticking close to the improvement we saw previously. Versus the stock cane pin card, we've boosted by 23% with LN2. The LN2 gaming was a lot of fun. It actually, uh, the results were surprisingly good. So 13% on average improvement, LN2 versus H2O overclocks. And then we saw an increase of about 23 to 25% over the baseline stock numbers for the already high stock clocked cane pin card. So overall, successful. And the actually important thing here was just to see how does the scaling apply to the real world? And if frequencies keep going up in a hypothetical scenario, we can now look at how Torian would scale in potentially future architectures. But realistically, it's just kind of fun. And this is uh, not something you should be doing at home. But if you wanted to get into liquid nitrogen overclocking for competitive reasons, then there's plenty of resources on how to do it. You'll need a doer, you'll need LN2. Uh, you absolutely need to read up on safety. 
it is fairly safe to do, but there are definitely things that, I mean, you could die if you do it wrong. Like it is a, a real actual hazard. You could die. So just make sure you read about what you're doing so you don't do anything stupid. But um, yeah, a lot of fun to see the results. Sniper Elite had some very good scaling, and that is a common trend for that particular title. When we were playing, when Patrick was messing around in GTA V, uh, we were we actually had to increase the graphic settings because we were running into the issue where we hit the GTA 5 frame rate cap of 187.5 FPS, at which point it'll stutter back really hard on specific CPUs. So we had to increase the graphic settings for that reason. And then frost buildup is uh, was not too difficult to manage. You just have to keep it cold and don't let it warm up, which means finding a stable overclock quickly and leaving it there. And for the overclock settings, we ended up at about 1.3, 1.325 for NVVDD and then 1.5 FBVDD and we left uh, PEX alone actually. We did, we did leave that one stock to 1.087. For the rest, uh, OCP was off and any other setting? Oh yeah, we tried overclocking Patrick's mouse while he was using it too. Or I, I, I tried it, I don't know that, he didn't exactly ask for it. But we did overclock the mouse with Ellen too. So yeah, that's, uh, that's gonna be it. Let us know what you think. We are considering doing a live stream of this once we get back from Computex. So if that's something you'd like to see, let us know. Subscribe. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net to help us out directly by buying a shirt like this one. This is the GPU artifacting shirt, which is particularly relevant if you're doing liquid nitrogen overclocking. And you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out there as well. But the most important thing is check back for our Computex coverage. We will be in Taiwan for a couple of weeks doing coverage in, uh, of the show and of areas around the show. Thanks for watching. I'll see you all next time.